Good morning, good morning. Got the papers. How are you? Another sunny day in paradise. A bit chilly. Oh, you can shut up. Angry's off to work again. Wrong glasses. Apparently they're going to invent some glasses that are auto-focus, which is about blooming time really, isn't it? If you think about it. Shouldn't be beyond the wit of man, should it? I mean, I can alter the focal length of these glasses by tipping them up like that. So why can't they just invent a, a pair that tip? Anyway. What should we talk about today? Come on, you've been very quiet lately. You suggest a subject. No? Oh, all right then. Well, I suppose I'll have to come up with another one. What about, what about, let me think, let me think, let me think. What about geriatric dentistry? Ah, ah, that's calculated to get you turning off, isn't it? As, oh, oh, geriatric dentistry. Oh, did you know NICE is just doing, uh, they're about to do one of their risible studies into geriatric dentistry. They're going to try and recommend to uh, the, uh, care homes, you know, the care of the dental care, how to improve dental care of elderly residents in, in uh, residential care. I mean, they, that is a subject that is even more fraught, more fraught, more than their advice to local authorities on how to commission dental health, more than their pathetic attempt to try and tell dentists how to improve dental health, and any attempt to try and tell the underpaid, overworked, underappreciated, transient staff in care homes what to do about people's mouths when they're really all they're worried about is the other end is going to be is going to be beyond funny what they come up with. I mean, let's okay, let's go, go back to basics, okay. How many times have people said to you, I don't want your job, I wouldn't want your job for all the tea in China? Yeah? Happens a lot. It used to happen to a lot to me. Not, not so much now, but when patients used to come in and see, you know, <laughs> a complete waiting room full of grot bags, or the people with the toothless, the people with toothless blackened stumps and that were waiting to see me, they you know, I could understand where that was coming from. And, you know, you get a sort of a standard response to that sort of... Oops, sorry, toolbox is in the back. Uh, more of that later. Uh, you know, the, the standard response is... My, my standard response was, uh, you know, I don't actually want all the tea in China. I'm quite happy with a couple of hundred thousand pounds a year. You know, which is... But it doesn't really... That doesn't really address the their central point is it which is that being a dentist is a grotesquely horrible job <laughs> and that whereas you might prostitute yourself to do it for a certain amount of money they certainly wouldn't yeah so I mean okay so they don't know that most of the time it's a really fantastic job um, but you know, we don't. I don't. Th we don't admit that sometimes it is grotesquely horrible, and all the grotesquely horrible bits I've had have all been related to geriatric dentistry, and and dentures in particular, dentures and geriatrics. Oh my God! I mean, there are there. You know, some of the some of the moments that where I've literally gone like that. <laughs> that is that is the sort of situation that these young girls mainly and boys in care homes are having to deal with those every single day, you know? I mean they are the people that I say I wouldn't want their job for all the tea in China. I mean, you know, you think it's bad enough dealing with people's mouths. I mean God knows how they manage to deal with what they deal with. So How do you, I mean, what can you do? What can you do? I mean, what? <clears throat> look at look at best practice, right? Look at 
people who, you know, people who perhaps who specialise in uh, gerontology and try and look at their their sort of, uh, their, you know, what would Tony Robbins say? Look at their mentality, you know. Try and see what motivates them to do it, how they do it, how they do it well, why they do it, why they do it, you know. It's the why more than anything. And unfortunately, unfortunately, you do tend to find that money is the motivating factor in many uh, cases, you know. You uh, <clears throat> you find that, uh, you know, people who do, the sort of people that go round and do dentures on a sort of peripatetic basis, go round visiting care homes and that, they used to do a lot of it, you know, they couldn't get enough of it. You you would have one or two care homes that you visited and, you know, and mainly for patients who'd been patients of yours who went into care homes and, you know, I mean, I, I'll never forget, I had a patient of mine who went into hospital and the first thing that the hospital did was they lost her dentures. And uh, so I went into the hospital and uh, made her a new set of dentures and put in a claim to the old dental estimates board, the dental practice board, and they just sent it back and said, no, uh, we don't, we're not responsible for making dentures for patients who are in hospital. The minute they step onto hospital premises, uh, they become the hospital's responsibility and the hospital makes them the dentures, not us, therefore, thank you very much, no, no money. The, I did know a dentist who, <coughs> who did like doing uh, I mean, I bought a practice off a chap in Canterbury who had, I think, at some point, the, the UK record for the biggest claim. Because in those days, you didn't have a budget. You just used to be judged by what you claimed for. And he claimed for a large number of dentures, and it was a denture practice. Um, but in his case, you know, they were... He, he was just like... He was <clears throat> very nervous about doing any sort of crown or bridges or anything. He didn't like doing root treatments. Dentures were sort of a simple, a nice simple Lego-like activity that, that he indulged in, you know, leading up to his retirement. But but uh, this other guy I know, I mean, two other guys, one, uh, as I say, was sort of very keen on doing domiciliary visits and doing dentures, and it turned out that um, <clears throat> he owned a care home, or a granny farm, as they are colloquially called. You know, the sort of place where you, you're charging like £100 a day per resident and there was no doubt he was in it for the money no doubt at all uh, a more money motivated individual I've yet to meet <clears throat> not I'm not not I, I mean probably there are people around who are more motivated now to earning money within the profession but they tend to uh, uh, you know they do well, I don't know you see this is the trouble I was going to say that you know perhaps they are more motivated to do cl good clinical work but I mean these, this, these guys the guys that are sort of retiring now they actually did you know at least they paid lip service to doing some sort of decent work uh, but um, but they, they sort of they did exploit the system you know under the old FIFA item but I don't think that he was in it for the right I mean, he, he was in it for the money. He wasn't in it because he loved doing dentures or working with old people, you know. And that's the problem with old people. Though. Very few people love them, you know. They're not, they're not as, a, as a group, they're not generally that likeable, you know. When you go around their houses, you you know, they, they, they're smoking like, well, they used to be smoking like chimneys. You would stick to the kitchen floor. You'd have to spend 20 minutes shouting at them through the letterbox before they'd even let you in because they uh, thought you were a burglar or someone trying to sell them, sell them brushes or vacuum cleaners. And uh, and then um, you know they'd serve you a cold cup of really really milky tea and and literally try and keep you talking for two hours because you're the only person that they've seen for two months. You know it's very difficult and you just sort of lose half a morning doing that. It's cheaper to pay for these people to come in in a taxi than it is. Anyway, the point was, <clears throat> the point I'm trying to make is that, uh, you know, <clears throat> you need to have sort of quite a deep understanding of uh, the treatment of the elderly before you start 
throwing your weight around and saying this is you know you ought to be doing this a bit better you know you don't want to do it like that you want to do it like this you know just first of all to really try and understand why it's, people do it like this and the answer is it is a pretty revolting job and uh, large amounts of cash I would suspect are the, are the sort of the motivating factor that you knew another dentist quite a well-known dentist called um, Paul Carlin uh, did a tremendous amount of domiciliary work and uh, out of hours, I mean mainly out of hours I think and um, you know made made a business of it literally uh, tried to tell the dental practice board that he was open in the morning from like one minute <laughs> from nine o'clock to 901 and then he shut and the rest of the time it was out of hours um, and he got struck off <laughs> you know because because just because there's no there's no you can't fund you know I mean he thought he thought he'd found a miracle way of funding domiciliary visits and there is no miracle way of funding domiciliary visits and the NHS doesn't you know the old cash hose the, the 300 million that Barry Cockroft threw at the National Health Service to try and get the last government re-elected no, he's not around anymore that's just absolutely not on the table that was it that was the last you know big big cash injection the dentist is ever going to get so uh, what's the solution I mean I, I, I'll tell you um, another story I'm going to talk it in the back of the car because I won't I won't have old angry being a tight wad I will not have two toolkits I have one toolkit and then keep it on and then I need it at work and then it, when it's at work I need it at home you know the old problem so I had the grandchildren I was babysitting yesterday and uh, decided that I needed to sort of waste some time because I had my granddaughter with me and so I'd give her a little trip out in the car so we decided to go and get the pick up the toolkit which was at work and I turned up at work and they were like, oh, we're just about to ring you. Oh, why is that? Oh, we've got this guy on the phone. He's literally crying in pain, crying. And uh, so we told him how much it was to have a tooth out. And he said he's got no money, absolutely no money at all. And could we pay him tomorrow? So, so I said, well, look, you know, <laughs> this guy, he needs to get him high off high himself off to the National Health Service who will you know if he's got absolutely no money at all then chances are he's exempt or if not then they do uh, they do do a dental line service here where but they still charge NHS prices it's not like it's free it's sort of an out of hours service for the uh, people who, who, who like to come in the evenings you know uh, you know just before they nick off up the pub and um, This is, this is another, this is a good example, I think, of how the private sector can sort of, or does, have to, does have to, mop up the, the, the sort of the people who fall through the NHS. Excuse me. <coughs> you know, you can do some pro bono work on the private, in the private sector that the NHS won't do, but should do. And you can tell when people are in a lot of pain because they I mean you can just tell you know I mean they talk to you and then there's like there's a silence at the end of the phone for about 20 seconds well they get like a real wave of, of pain and then anyway cut a long story short this young guy been back to his NHS dentist and told he'd, he'd been deregistered they couldn't see him even though he's obviously in severe pain. So the, the, the clear breach of the ethics of the profession in turning away someone who, you know, I mean, not, not even, I mean, you, you really shouldn't turn away someone with no connection with your practice in that sort of distress. 
let alone someone who, who was a patient of yours until you say quite recently. So they won't see him. So it, again, you know, I said to them, look, you know, how soon can he get here? So they rang me back and they said, look, you know, we can we can get you out of your pain, which is really all I was thinking. I just get get him out of his pain because I've I've been in that sort of pain. I decided I had a root treatment done. I had a, a lot of restorative dentistry done when I was a boy, and my upper left six had a MOD and it snapped in half. It literally had a crack that went vertically, and the tooth came in came into two halves. And, so I had it root treated, I went up to uh, Wim uh, Lister House, had it root treated by, by the best uh, guy you know in the country to root treat, had, um, had it crowned to try and hold the two halves of the tooth together, didn't work and I just ended up with, in so much pain, I could really you know because and I think it was good and I did it deliberately, I deliberately, I deliberately did not seek help <laughs> knowing this pain was going to get worse because I thought to myself how bad can it be how bad can it be and I got to tell you it's pretty bad <laughs> okay it's worse it's worse than I can put up with I got to the point where I was literally banging my head on the wall to dive to try and divert myself from the pain and it, I know it sounds stupid but that is literally how bad I got and then and then I went along and saw someone and, and and instantly the pain was gone you know so and I think that's useful because like I, I give out advice on dentures but I don't wear dentures I can give out advice out on bridges now since I had this bridge uh, I can give out advice on crowns and can't give out I could give out advice on brushing and stuff like that but I can't give out advice on uh, on, on something I haven't had and I'm, I'm you know in a way it's good that I've had this really really severe pain Anyway, we've got this guy in, and um, sure enough, uh, he's got a classic NHS filling in his lower right seven. You can see it straight away, right? It was it was it was sort of brighter than the rest of the fillings. It's it's been done more recently. It's it was an odd shape, you know. It doesn't. It's sort of <laughs> it's not within the cusps, and yet it doesn't replace the cusps. It's just like a big old slab of silver. It runs from front to back, gets slightly bigger as it goes backwards. It's It's got all the smear marks all over the occlusal surface from where the, someone had used a ball burnisher just to smear it in. And the classic uh, NHS high spot, real burnished high spot right in the middle of the tooth where um, no attempt has been made to carve it or, or accommodate the, the uh, opposing tooth. And so you've just got this massive grey flat flat amalgam with a big old silver spot in the middle of it where the top tooth banging into it. So of course the nerves died off. I mean this guy, this the, the, the DO on this filling obviously was into the nerve. I'm only amazed that it didn't give him trouble straight away. I can only I can only guess why. And um, you know and then and so what's happened is um, the nerves died off. And he's in severe pain and the dentist has told him to take a to take a long walk on a short pier. So we got him in and um, my granddaughter had to wait while I uh, did a rather difficult extirpation on a lower right seven. But um, I know we've got off the topic a bit, but I mean the topic, I mean basically the topic was about, uh, it's a difficult topic for dentists, you know, what constitutes the part, the part of the job that we don't like doing and why we do it, you know, and, and to what extent are we motivated by money? And I think that the problem that these guys who are doing the geriatric survey will have is that there is no money available to do the sort of uh, high quality geriatric care. You know, the patients will continue not to have their teeth brushed. They will continue not to have their dentures cleaned. They'll probably continue not even to have their dentures taken out. Um, perhaps they'll come up with some, some lunatic requirement that every, but every denture in the country should be labelled with the patient's name and national insurance number or something, but I don't know. If you can think of an easy, a big, you know, like an easy win in geriatrics, then, you know, by all means, let me know and I'll mention it tomorrow. But I don't think, I don't think there is one. I don't think you can expect care staff to, to do what most dentists find 
repugnant, you know, and, and have to do with a mask on and, and rubber gloves and, and and a clothes peg on our nose. Yeah, it's got to be done, but uh, but I don't know. Anyway, if you've got any suggestions, let me know. That's me. I'm at work. I hope you are too. Earn some money. New tax here. Let's get cracking. Okay, bye.